Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you may happen to be on God's glorious earth. Welcome to Balance Point. I know that it has been a while since we've put out a recording, and I can only ask for your forgiveness. Um, I let life get in the way of doing God's work. But we're here, we're recording, and um, we're reworking and rethinking how we handle Balance Point uh, with the long-term goal of being a sustainable ministry that brings the Word of God to a hungry world. Anyway, we are going to be continuing in our study in the Gospel of Luke, and we are still in Chapter 9. This is part five of Luke chapter nine. But before we begin, let us bow our hearts. Father God, we just come before you and we just ask in the mighty name of Jesus that you would in your mercy and grace rain down upon us. Father God, let everything that is sent out over this internet, over the, this, these wires, this airways, be a glory to you. Father, let nothing be said that is not of your spirit. And Father God, I pray that we would have open ears and open hearts to receive that which you have prepared for us. And that you might receive all glory, all honor, all praise in the mighty name of your son, Jesus. Amen and amen. The title of today's lesson is The Greatness of God. And we are here in the fifth part of the Gospel of Luke chapter 9. And we are looking at kind of some of the aftermath of the Transfiguration up on the mountain and the casting out of the uh, demon from the epileptic son. And we ask ourselves, what is the greatness of God? What makes God great? Is it his power? Is it where he lives? Is it the fact that he is all knowing? All loving, all gracious. Well, the reality is many get it wrong. Many have a wrong idea of what makes God great and what is the greatness of God. And those wrong ideas go all the way back to Satan, Satan himself. Lucifer himself had a wrong idea of what made God great. And in fact, he strove to achieve that wrong idea of God's greatness. In Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14, the Holy Spirit through the prophet Isaiah gives us an idea Let's us into the thinking of Lucifer. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. And here it comes. Here is what Lucifer seems to think it means to be God. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. Really? So God's greatness comes from the fact that he's in heaven? Maybe. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. So God's greatness comes from the fact that God's throne is above that of the angels, according to Lucifer. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation, on the farthest sides of the north. So Lucifer seems to think that God's greatness comes from the fact that 
He is in some way distant, some way unapproachable. I will ascend above, above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High God. So, in this passage, we see that Lucifer's idea of what it means to be God, or one of his concepts of what it means to be God, is where God lives. But there are some who believe that God's greatness stems or comes from what he does. And this is also an idea that, again, Satan or Lucifer believes about God. Job chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Here we, have, we, we get to see a little bit of what goes on in heaven. And we see that at this point in time, Satan or Lucifer still has access to heaven and still has some access to God's throne. And so listen to the conversation between God and Satan. And then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth. A blameless and upright man. Notice God didn't say that Job was sinless, but rather that Job was blameless. You see, we all sin, we all fall short. But by God's grace and by God's mercy, we can be declared blameless. But I'm getting off on a tangent. A blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. So Satan answered God, answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around his household? In other words, the reason that Job worships you is because you protect him. And around all that he has on his side, you have blessed the work of his hands. In other words, Satan is saying, God, Job thinks that you are great because of what you've given him, because of what you've done, and his possessions have increased in the land. And, and watch this. Satan believes that man only considers God to be great because of the things that God does, health, wealth, and prosperity. And watch what Satan challenges God to do. Now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. So, a couple of places where people get it wrong. Either they believe it's because of where God lives. Yeah, God's in heaven. That's what makes him great. Or it's because of what God does. Yes, you know, God takes care of us. But here in our passage, in Luke chapter 9, we're going to see the true greatness of God. Luke chapter 9, beginning at verse 43, and it's going to be up here on the screen. And they were amazed at the majesty of God. Why were they amazed? Because they just witnessed Jesus casting a demon out of an epileptic boy. But while everyone marveled at the things that Jesus did, he, that's Jesus, said to his disciples, let these words sink down into your ears for the son of man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men let these words sink in so while the people were marveling at the great deed that Jesus had done Jesus redirects his disciples' vision, their gaze, to look at what's about to happen. Jesus is predicting his death. Let these words sink into your ears, for the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands 
a man. And so here we see what God considers to be greatness. And that thing is self-sacrifice. That thing is being willing to set aside my own best interest for the interests of those around me. So that, that's the first thing that we see. The next thing that we see carries on. Oh, and, and let me finish up that, that little passage and then we'll move on to the next section. But they did not understand the same, for it was hidden from them, so that they did not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him about the saying. They were afraid. They, they, they were like, well, what are you talking about? We just saw you do something really great really awesome but now here's another issue of greatness what is greatness picking up our passage <clears throat> then a dispute arose among them as to which of them would be the greatest and Jesus perceiving the thought of their heart took a little child and sat him by him and said to them, whoever receives this little child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you will be great. So watch this. Jesus takes a little child and puts that little child next to him and says, you are going to, if you wish to be great, you must be like this little child. Now understand in that day and age, little children were pretty much disregarded. You know, they, 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 were, they were considered to be, you know, just, just there. And so for Jesus to take a little child and put that little child next to him and, say, and, and use the little child as an example, he's saying, look, greatness is born not of great deeds. Greatness isn't born of being at the right hand of the Father. In, in fact, my dear brothers and sisters, it was Satan's idea that he would ascend and sit his throne next to God is what got Satan in the trouble. That pride of being lifted up to be like God. Now, here's an ironic bit. To those who come and are like a little child, God says, come and sit with my son, Jesus. So true greatness comes from giving oneself. True greatness comes from believing on Jesus in the simplicity of a child. True greatness comes from bringing the simple in mind, the childlike in mind, the childlike in spirit into the presence of God. That is true greatness. True greatness is setting aside our wants, our desires, and being willing to sacrifice for the benefit of others, for the benefit of those around us. It's explained a little bit more fully in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Jesus Christ, who being in the form of God. In other words, Jesus is God. But watch this. As God, he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. He was already equal with God. In the beginning was the word. And the Word was God, and the Word was with God. 
He didn't consider robbery to be equal with God. But watch what God did. But he made himself of no reputation. In other words, Jesus set aside the privilege, the prerogatives of the Godhead. And he took on the form of a bondservant. He took on the form of a slave. What kind of a slave? He watches becoming in the likeness of men. How can you say a man was a slave? Well, until Jesus came, we were a slave to sin. We were sold out to sin. But Jesus emptied himself of what the prerogatives of God, and he became a man. And watch this, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. So he not only became a man, but he allowed himself to be killed. And not just to be killed, but to be killed in a form of execution that was the lowest of the low, that was the most heinous. So not just, not just killed, but killed in the form of a common criminal. He emptied himself. And what's the result of that? Therefore, God has also exalted him highly and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow, those in heaven, those on earth, those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So in becoming a servant, in becoming emptying himself, Jesus became the greatest thing. You see, God's greatness comes from humility. If you want to know what the greatest thing about God is, it's his humility. Because consider this, God did not have to save you and me. When the first man and woman sinned, God could have just wiped it right then. Boom, done, start over. God could have presented himself however he wanted. He could have come riding a flaming vehicle like Ghost Rider, but he didn't. God could have peeled back the heavens and stuck his face in the sky and said, I'm God, you're not, but you know what? I'm going to, I, I declare you saved. But he didn't. True greatness comes from the human touch. And that's how God relates to us. If we want to be truly great in the eyes of God, then we must relate to each other out of the love, out of the human touch. Watch this. God could relate to us however he wanted, but he chooses to relate to us on a human level. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day. God chose to relate to the man and the woman as they were here on earth. Again, God could have rolled back the sky and gone, hey guys, how y'all doing? But he didn't. God came walking in the garden. True humility, I'm sorry, true greatness of God comes from how God has presented himself. And if we're to be truly great in the kingdom, our greatness is going to be dependent on how we present ourselves. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 11 through 13. 1 Kings 19, 11 through 13. Let me set the scene. The prophet, Elijah, has just had a great confrontation on Mount Carmel. 
he's caught fire down from the sky. The fire burnt the offering, burnt the wood, licked up the water, and then the prophet goes about the business of killing the prophets of Baal. Jezebel has heard that he is oft her prophets. And Jezebel says, may it be so and much and more so if you aren't like them in the coming days. And so Elijah takes off running. And Elijah has ended up <clears throat> on this mountainside. And God basically is like, dude, what are you doing here? So God chooses to come down to the mountain to meet the prophet. And we pick up in verse 11. And he said, that's God, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke the rocks into pieces before the Lord. Now you would think that a great and strong wind, that would be God. But the Lord was not in the wind. You think something flashy, something spectacular, that would be God. No. And after the wind, an earthquake. So you would think that the ground shaking, the earth quaking, the mountain moving, that God would be in the earthquake. Something flashy, something big, something like But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire blazing hot. Flames shooting up all around. And you would think that God would have been in the fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. You know something interesting about a little child? Their voices tend to be small. And so God related to the prophet through a still, small voice. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. God's greatness comes from the fact that he relates to us in our weakness, in our frailty. We will likewise be great when we relate to each other in each other's weakness and frailty. God's greatness comes from his proximity. In other words, his nearness from our passage. And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a little child and set him by him. In other words, God, Jesus, took the little child and put him right next to him. What is our proximity to our brothers and sisters? What is our proximity to our neighbor? Do we sow into their lives the way God would sow into our lives? Do we allow God to be sown into their lives through us? Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, referring to the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. God's greatness comes from his nearness. Our greatness will come from how near we choose to be to those around us. You see, more than power, more than knowledge, God's greatness comes from relationship. Think of it this way. How many great people, I'm sorry, think of it this way. There are many great people in the earth. 
There are many rich people, many powerful people, many people who make the wheels of society turn. They may even pass laws and regulations and rules. But here's the question for all of those great people. How many of them actually matter in our lives? I mean, I mean, literally, how many of them actually <clears throat> have an effect on our day-to-day -day lives, on our daily existence? How many of them can affect us? And how many do we affect? You see, you would think that a person is great because of their power, because of their knowledge, because of their because of their wealth. But quite honestly, unless there is some effect upon our lives, they are no different than a grain of sand on the beach to us. You see, God is great because he's available to us. We have various friends and relatives and, and members of our congregation, people in our neighborhood that quite honestly are much greater in our lives. Why? Because they are available to us. We become great to God in a practical sense when we choose to be available to him. And our greatness is not bound by what we do for him. Our greatness in God's eyes is all about us being with them. It doesn't have anything to do with what we do. Last little part of our scripture. Boop. Now, John answered and said, Master, we saw somebody casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow us. And Jesus said to him, Do not forbid him, for he who is not against us is on our side. You see, greatness doesn't have to do so much with who we are. I'm sorry, with what we do, as it has to do with who we're near. And so my question to you, my question to me today is, have we achieved greatness in God's eyes? Have we drawn close to him as he is drawn close to us? Have we allowed the abundant love that God has poured out upon us to flow out of us and to those around us? Now, I understand that what I'm asking is a tall ask. And Jesus himself said, with man it is impossible. It is impossible for me to love the way God will, the way God loves. But Jesus also said that, but with God, all things are possible. All things. So I challenge us this day to become great. To become great lovers, to become great people, to become great encouragers and companions. To become great bringers and includers. To become great at sacrificing so that others might know the Father through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for this time in your word. We ask, Father God, for your blessing, for your grace, for your mercy. Father God, have your way with this word. Do not let it just drop and be you know, unknown, unheard. 
But Father God, let it be known, let it be heard. In the mighty name of your son, Jesus, amen and amen. We invite you to contact us. We have multiple ways of getting in contact with us. You can email us at staff at bound-point.org. You can message us through our Facebook page, balance.cc. That's balance.cc. Or our YouTube page at Bounce Point Church. We love hearing what God is doing in and through you. We invite you to come check out our ministry center where you can find the back catalog of our messages at www.balance-point.org. That is www.balance-point.org. We do have a virtual sanctuary where, again, you can find our replays, and that is at balance.point. <laughs> I almost gave us the old email address. It's balancepoint.online.church. And we'd like to thank LifeChurch.tv for making that platform available to ministries like ours. If you need prayer, we would love to pray for you. And you can send an email to prayer at balance-point.org or you can actually use the comment form at the ministry center. If you want your prayer to remain confidential, just put confidential in the subject line and that prayer request will just simply be directed right here to the leadership of Bounce Point. For general contact, you can contact us at bounce-point.org. And we would like to ask you to do us a great and mighty favor. If you're watching this on YouTube, would you please like and share this video so that the Word of God can get disseminated greatly throughout the world. And if you're on Facebook, like and share this video to um, to your news feed. Again, we are a nonprofit. In fact, we do not take donations because God has blessed us. And our one goal, our one desire <clears throat> is to bring the word of God to a hungry world. And you can help us by liking and sharing. And more importantly than that, pray for us here at Balance Point. That we might be effective in the calling that God has laid before us. And so now, with that, receive the blessing. May the God of heaven and earth bless each and every one of you with his proximity with his nearness, with his love, and with his grace, that you might know the love of his son Jesus, our Lord and Savior, in the mighty name of his son. Amen. <laughs>